Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are, and thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Community Impact with Open Data, two models from Canada and the United States. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending. Uh, today we're going to be talking about two different approaches to community use of open data, one from Open North, a Canadian nonprofit, and one from the Sunlight Open Cities team, Tactical Data Engagement. You can learn more about both of the approaches that we're going to be talking about at the URLs on your screen, opennorth.ca and sunlightfoundation.com slash TDE. My name is Alex Dodds. I'm the Open Cities Storyteller at the Sunlight Foundation and the Open Cities team. And today we're going to hear from two speakers. The first is Jean-Louis Landry, Executive Director for Open North. And the second is Stephen Larrick, Open Cities Director for the Sunlight Foundation. Um, everyone here is on Twitter and would welcome your comments or questions um, at the Twitter handles that you see. You can also tweet about this conversation or uh, with questions that you have throughout the discussion um, at the hashtag tactical data or you can tweet at us directly. Our handle on Twitter is Sunlight City. Um, with that, I'm going to let our speakers get started and we're going to begin with Open North. So Jean-Louis, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, thank you for uh, <clears throat> I think this great opportunity to kind of share best practices. Um, I think uh, you know, from, from Open North's perspective, um, you know, we've been involved just like Sunlight Foundation in the open data uh, conversation for, you know, for quite some time and it feels almost like we're, we're getting to work on, on issues and challenges that we, we wanted to, to work on maybe 10 years ago. And so now it's kind of like the good stuff, right? And part of it is about engaging uh, stakeholders and working with cities and, and kind of realizing that you know, there are so many different opportunities to, to utilize data. So the, the slide that you see here, um, in particular for kind of the audience from, uh, from the U.S., um, just gives you a bit of a synopsis of, of who we are. So established in 2011, uh, Canada's leading nonprofit organization specializing in open data and civic technology. You can see our, our areas of focus here and our expertise. Um, and you know, we, we helped build some of the first open data portals in, in Canada, worked on some of the early uh, policies as well, developed an expertise around data standards. But um, I think the, the challenge and the problem area that we're discussing today in terms of community impact is really, you know, so to speak, when the, when the rubber meets the road and when you really want to be able to get a return on kind of the investments that are being made um, by cities and connect with different types of users. So happy to share our, uh, our approach that we've been developing iteratively over the last uh, uh, few months. Um, and just to kind of sum up and take a kind of a, a high level kind of picture around, you know, some of, the, some of the challenges that we're seeing here from an engagement perspective, which, you know, will likely resonate with, you know, cities in the south of the border and in the U.S. Um, so, you know, if you build it, they don't come usually. You know, data publication doesn't lead to, to engagement. Um, so going to the issue of, like, discoverability of, of data, but then going way past that. And kind of, I think, new sets of expectations that exist from citizens and stakeholders in terms of co-production. Um, and kind of new ways of, of interacting using data. Um, you know, civic problems can affect obviously multiple sectors and stakeholders, and so having that kind of multi-perspective approach that enables you to really get a fuller picture and understanding of, uh, you know, problems, root causes, and then really looking at data assets, I think is something that we've seen kind of arise, um, but it's certainly something that creates maybe a little bit of, of discomfort from, uh, from cities in terms of kind of having to equip themselves with new ways of engaging. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> then, you know, that open data is meant to have a use and, and be engaging for, for citizens. It's not just about the formats and, you know, the quality of data. It's about, you know, being able to have a process of engagement around that. And so the story that I'll tell today is, is primarily based around some work that we've done with the City of Toronto, so Canada's largest city, um, where Open North has given the mandate to develop its um, open data master plan and roadmap. So if we're looking at the operationalization of the strategy that we helped develop. Um, the City of Toronto obviously had done and you know, had a, a strong track record in terms of the work that it was already uh, doing uh, on the open data file. Uh, in terms of, you know, it had already had a, an open data policy. There was already a process leading towards the development of the master plan. But 
we came in to be able to kind of lead an, engage, an engagement process internally and externally uh, with the city and with the open data team. Um, some of the issues that the city had identified is, you know, um, you know what's, what's the value added of currently available data? Um, how do you generate that, that impact um, you know, beyond a core group of uh, well-known open data uh, advocates or um, you know, the, the, the civic tech community locally? So how to kind of get into these outer layers and outer rings of you know, different types of constituencies as well. Um, and then obviously the you know, core principles of transparency and accountability um, and moving from a kind of a statement of principles but then to carry that into types of actions and ways of engaging with, uh, with stakeholders. Um, problem framing is you know, obviously not new for, for a city. I mean I've here you know, I think there's probably we identified maybe 40 or 50 different types of problem areas that the city of Toronto uh, through a, a range of different you know, agencies and divisions was already focused on. And so there's like very <clears throat> kind of fertile ground to be able to kind of weave open data as part of a, um, a problem identification, a data kind of accessibility and kind of solutions, uh, you know, development and co-design process based on existing priorities and existing areas of, of focus of, of the city. Um, I think for, for any of these you could really kind of you know, look at what's the value out of, of open data, and then it's the key question about like where do you go and how do you identify those stakeholders to bring them into this conversation in a structured, sustainable way. Um, we came up with, a, and I'm going to kind of showcase a bit of a case study that we looked at, and then also kind of set out you know, our key steps for our cluster model that we've developed. But we kind of wanted to reflect a little bit about, well, what's a what's a good problem? Uh, question mark, and you know, what's a problem selection checklist? Not all problems or issue areas are conducive for um, uh, effective engagement, um, and so you know, we listed some uh, some here in terms of factors to, to consider. Uh, including, well, you know, uh, is there already some, some momentum or some uh, stakeholders that are already engaged on the issue? Um, is there uh, an identified need for, uh, for solutions with the kind of level of expertise and experience around that issue area? Um, you know, is the issue like specific or is it kind of very, very broad? Or are we really talking about one problem or multiple problems that are kind of, you know, fitted, fitted under a, a broad umbrella? Um, is there political buy-in for, for the problem as well? So where's, where did that leadership come from inside the city, but then also from uh, representatives as well? Um, and then obviously the data piece, which we'll go uh, into a little bit more. So that's, that's, that's kind of an easy framework that I think could probably apply to other cities as well. Um, in thinking about our cluster model, we adopted a, uh, what we call a uh, field building approach. So, you know, here's a, a a definition from a, uh, an organization here based in Canada called the Social Innovation Generation. Um, and really what this means is, you know, how do you have different communities of practice or different kind of communities kind of uh, interact with one another in a way that they uh, complement the, uh, you know, from a, their own skill set that they bring to the table in terms of their own perspectives, in terms of, you know, being able to improve outcomes, but having that openness to be able to kind of bring these different communities together. Um, you know, we know, you know, from being very active, obviously, in the open data community that, you know, the open data community knows a lot about a lot of different types of issues, um, but not necessarily a lot of different communities know or understand the value added of open data. And so I think there's an imperative for the open data community to become kind of effective allies in demonstrating the value added of opening up data and all the potential around, around that. So a field building approach lends itself really well to a resilience types of issues, for example. So the four steps of the, the cluster model, um, you know, pretty basic, but it, you know, we'll unpack that in a second. So your problem framing, mapping data sources, uh, data engagement challenges, and then uh, data-driven solutions. And the data engagement challenges really gets to, you know, the capacity of different stakeholders to be able to work with data effectively. Um, and, you know, what are the different types of issues surrounding that. Um, so the case study that we put together when we, uh, as we were developing the cluster model was on, around the issue of affordable housing. And you'll see that I, I relate back the, uh, you know, the, uh, the good problem checklist uh, here as I, as I make the case for this. Um, so a clear uh, public need for, for solutions. These are 
kind of your classic uh, kind of headline shots from uh, different local newspapers, um, kind of demonstrating that you know this is a, a live debate in the in the Toronto area. Obviously, affordable housing is an issue that's kind of, kind of cross-cutting, almost universal. If we if we uh, you know if we look at cities around the world, um, but you know a clear need, um, but not necessarily one where uh, the data. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a data-driven conversation, but there's definitely kind of lots of awareness about this because it has a direct impact on the livelihoods of, of residents and, and communities. Um, so the well-being of, of citizens, this is where, well, actually, you can quantify this. Um, and this is a quote from the, uh, the Greater Toronto Area, um, you know, a profile on, on hunger that was done by the Daily Bread. Uh, food bank, um, safe and affordable housing is key to the health and well-being of Toronto residents. Households must spend 30% of, or less of their income on housing for it to be considered affordable. Expenditure of 50% or less greatly increases the risk of homelessness. So obviously, rising housing uh, prices, you know, has a big impact on this. So this is a this is a live issue. It's a live concern for especially for you know uh, populations that are a little bit more vulnerable. Um, uh, mobilized communities, so no surprise, lots of different organizations and stakeholders, you know, from inside, outside the, the social sector, from private companies, uh, you know, from academia as well, um, you know, think tanks, uh, private sector, uh, tenant uh, or associations. Um, understanding the data ecosystem in this case, and this could really lend itself to kind of a, a mapping uh, exercise. Um, and not just looking at um, public data, um, but treating open data more broadly than government information, but other sources of, of data. And obviously that brings up a, a range of challenges around data quality, data accessibility, um, you know, ensuring that the data is structured and updated and, and made available in a comprehensive, machine-readable way. Um, so these are just some of the examples of data sources that kind of provide that full picture beyond simply uh, a public data, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, inventory. Uh, potential complementary data sources. So I've, I've listed already a few in the previous slide. Um, you know, this is, these are the different types of stakeholders that would need to be, you know, who are the data custodians for each of these different uh, sources and how can they be engaged meaningfully. There's obviously some interests and, you know, potentially values that are, you know, at odds with uh, themselves when you start kind of convening different types of stakeholders like this. Um, Data-driven solutions. So in, um, in Toronto, this was what, an example of a, uh, a uh, platform that was created to, you know, rank and, you know, identify the 100 worst landlords in, in Toronto. And at face value, that might be kind of a, an effective or a good app or a good kind of platform. But it, I think there's also something to be said about kind of the ethics of, of data and how it's used and what the a tool like this tells you about uh, what's being represented and what's not, right? What's the context of the data itself? And so having looked at a couple of case studies, what we did is that we decided to prototype our, our cluster uh, model uh, for engagement. Um, we did this at a, uh, an event in, in Toronto as well, shortly after we had completed the master plan for, for the city of Toronto. Um, and we did this, you know, looking at civic issues as opposed to kind of issues affecting the, the social sector. Um, really mindful of kind of this being a, a process oriented and kind of systems change kind of approach to the way that we look at it, not just a kind of a one off kind of event like a, like a hackathon, for example, but really kind of understanding that you know a conversation that we were able to have over a half day session would probably lend itself to multiple different touch points and workshops as well. Um, so first uh, first step you know in terms of problem framing. Um, just really exercising some mindfulness here and being aware, um, you know, being aware that you know who is defining the, this problem and who's not, and who's who's not in the room that participates in the convening from from a city. Um, you know, how to really kind of empower and respect and make um, you know those stakeholders to be able to to have a meaningful voice. Um, at the table, and, and where does the, the problem originate? Has it been dealt with in the past? You know, what are the preconceptions that we have when looking at this? I think often we get into kind of solutions design before having a really good diagnostic of the problem. And this step is, is really, uh, you know, put in place to be able to ensure that we have that strong basis before kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Um, looking at step number two, so this is where we get into mapping data sources. 
Um, and here I like to kind of separate the data sources into <clears throat> maybe three different kind of broad categories. You know, the data that's um, already available that you know should be accessible, uh, and open data, data that exists that you know could be available in machine readable format that may not be accessible um, or discoverable by stakeholders. And then you also have that kind of uh, you know, a little bit more challenging zone where you know, are, are there sources of information or data that you know, should exist but that don't currently exist? And how do we look at uh, existing um, you know, means of collecting data to uh, alter those in order to collect data that's more meaningful for the problem that we're trying to, to resolve? Um, there's obviously some biases that are introduced in, in any data collection method and naming that uh, from an ethical perspective is obviously something that's quite important. Um, being mindful of the time here, I'm just going to move ahead to step three. So in data engagement challenges, I think is you know really depends on the the, the group that's um, you know that's convened here. Within the case of Spark, uh, with the event that we hosted, um, it was mainly from the civic sector. Um, you may you know even kind of view this as a kind of almost like a focus group. Maybe you want to be able to have a more homogeneous kind of population, you know, to uh, to do this type of exercise, or you want to have a diversity of, of age, experience, knowledge of data. I don't think that you need to be a data expert to be able to participate in this. Sometimes, you know, the even more kind of meaningful contributions in terms of setting uh, and understanding a problem comes from people that don't necessarily have technical skills as well. Uh, but recognizing engagement challenges and the barriers to engagement in terms of capacity and knowledge and accessibility to information is something that that needs to be registered. Um, and then last but not least, this is where we get into uh, data-driven solutions. Um, and you know, in a way, the, you know, the four-step cluster model that we're proposing is kind of setting the stage for a longer-term engagement process that can lead to kind of co-development, co-design, co-creation of, of solutions depending on the types of sponsorships and, and alignment that you can get to, with these. Um, and then for, for Spark, the event that, you know, where the workshop that we hosted in, in fall 2017, um, you know, one of the key issues that came out was around like opening up police data. Um, and this was very much from a civic kind of perspective. And what are the, you know, the, the repercussions of, of police data, um, you know, from a civic uh, and social justice kind of uh, perspective. Privacy protection in, in smart cities and data governance was named as one. I think that in retrospect, we probably would have wanted to focus a little bit more kind of specifically on kind of civic issues as opposed to issues affecting the social sector. But I think that's something that you know, we're, we're now looking at other, other places to, to be able to deploy that methodology. And last but not least, some you know, uh, lessons learned from our prototype uh, approach. Well, you know, to seek alignment with other city initiatives, uh, that's good kind of open documentation and to see kind of adopt the values of transparency and kind of making kind of, you know, your reflections available to kind of carry a conversation forward, I think is, is critical. To be ready to be challenged, I think for, for government that's important, you know, to have to find that champion champion who's comfortable with being put on the spot a little bit. Um, mindfulness around who's not in the room, as I've said, um, and anticipate already the scalability and interoperability issues of types of solutions that could come out and look at what other cities are doing because you're probably not dealing with that problem uh, for the first time and kind of learn from what others have, uh, have done. So I'll stop at that um, and then, uh, yeah, switch it over to, uh, to Stephen. Thanks so much, Shonwee, and uh, great to hear more about the cluster model you all are working on and excited to kind of think through it in the context of, of our own work here at Sunlight. Um, so my name is Stephen Larrick. I'm the director of the Open Cities team here at the Sunlight Foundation. Um, today I'm going to be talking through um, uh, Sunlight's model for connecting open data to community engagement, um, which is called tactical data engagement. And specifically I'll be doing an overview of, of just our framework as well as a summary of, of our pilot in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so not quite Canada, still pretty far north so, uh, to us. Um, so for those on the, on the webinar who don't know us, um, the Sunlight Foundation is a national nonprofit. We, we advocate for government transparency and accountability through technology at every level of government. Um, and the Open Cities team uh, advocates for data that is uh, for both data driven and data democratized cities. Um, we've been doing this for a while now, um, and 
Our work has included both tracking open data policies across over 100 U.S. cities, um, supporting over 60 U.S. cities with open data technical assistance through the What Works Cities initiative, um, developing web tools to help um, support the development of open data policy by anyone, um, and most recently, um, really what, what our team has been focused on, what's been getting me out of bed in the morning, has been this question of how can we make open data more people-centered in a way that makes it more socially impactful. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is exactly that. Um, so this is just a quick overview. I'm going to give a conceptual background on our model, um, which is called tactical data engagement. Um, the conceptual mumbo jumbo will lead into really what, what the heck is this practically. Um, and then we'll get into what does it actually look like on the ground in Madison, Wisconsin. Ooh, our, uh, our font here is displaying um, not quite as it was, but okay. Conceptual background, here's what tactical data engagement is. Um, really, conceptually, what we, what we think of for, uh, in terms of tactical data engagement is really driven from a similar place to some of the things we heard um, Jean-Louis speak to. Um, really, we want to help city halls get more impact out of their open data initiatives by helping community members actually use their data. Publication does not equal use, it does not equal impact, it does not equal collaboration. Um, so it's a four-step, what we call tactical approach um, for supporting your community's use of open data. Um, and uh, we'll get to this a little bit further on, but it, it starts with a locally relevant issue, kind of similarly to how the cluster model um, starts with a problem focus. Um, and so this idea of both specificity, taking a narrow focus, and segmentation, I think we'll see as a parallel um, between the two models. Um, so first a little bit about our, our inspiration. Um, we were really inspired specifically by, um, we, we saw these two needs, one for um, a focus on specifics and on people, and the other on experimentation and incremental improvement. Um, so in the context of open data programs, um, we've seen there's, there's a need to not necessarily think about this as strictly a technical problem, but as a people-centered problem. So we really drew heavy, heavy inspiration from human-centered design and from design thinking generally. Um, and then in the context of making cities better incrementally, um, we, we thought about this, uh, this, this, this concept of tactical urbanism, of what can you do with the materials you have, um, with the capacity you have in the here and now, to make improvement to test out whether things, solutions are working um, in ways that can then become more permanent change. Um, so we see these as two critical components to how we think about um, tactical data engagement and the ways that cities can improve their open data programs. Um, so we, we kind of ate our own dog food in terms of developing this model. Um, we developed a beta guide and, and with our existing capacities and with some desk research and, and, uh, and field research, put that out as a beta guide to the community and, and um, accepted a lot of feedback from uh, open data experts as well as from practitioners uh, and those that we were piloting the approach with. And we now have an updated model um, based on that approach. So anyway, what is this actually practically? Uh, it's, it's a four-step process. Um, the four steps are finding a focus area by observing the community, refining use cases by interviewing stakeholders, designing a plan by coordinating with target users, and implementing an intervention by collaborating with actual users. And so one of the things you can see here is that the scope narrows in as you mine more context and information. You're able to focus in on a specific opportunity um, for, a, for what in the cluster model we heard about as a data-driven solution um, and, a, and a specific opportunity for partnership and collaboration. Um, the other component of it is, is really that it is um, it, it's tactical. There are different ways that cities can achieve each of these steps. We think each of these steps are critical, but there are lots of ways to scan a cat, lots of ways to, to do each of these four steps. Um, so let's go through each of the four steps. Um, first is finding a focus area by observing the community. Uh, okay, maybe this slides are a little out of order here. So we already covered this. Uh, 
In addition to kind of the ideas being tactical and there being many ways to complete each step, I also do want to note that each step requires actual ground truthing through collaboration with community stakeholders. Um, and that kind of who your, your target collaborator is becomes more specific as you get closer and closer to that data-driven solution to that intervention. Um, so now we're going to dive into what this work has looked like on the ground in Madison. And I apologize if some of these slides are a little out of order here. Um, so bear with me if, if I need to go back. Um, first, we're, we're going to kind of talk through how we found a specific starting point um, for thinking through open data in Madison, Wisconsin. And I think as uh, Jean-Louis mentioned in the cluster model, it can be difficult to try to design an open data program to meet the needs of everyone all at once. And so really, with the idea of starting with either a focus area or a problem, as we heard about in the cluster model, is to help you target in on something that's going to have real application and relevance um, and can help you with some of those activities like mapping stakeholders that we heard about. Um, so in Madison, the tactic we used to find a focus area was by listening to signals that might point to community priorities and information needs. So again, we wanted to build on what was already going on on the ground in Madison. Um, so we, the city had uh, an existing rates to equity report that really looked at, um, at issues of equity and race in the city where there's quite um, kind of polarizing issues both geographically and in terms of uh, socioeconomic uh, outcomes. And so this was, this was clearly in the ethos and of clear importance. The rates to equity report used a lot of data to try to address these issues. So it was something we wanted to build upon. Um, the other places we looked were to an existing planning effort called Imagine Madison. Um, this was a, a, a really impressive outreach uh, push that the city department of planning was, was leading that was gathering a lot of feedback about what issues mattered uh, to residents of Madison. And so by building on that existing work, we were able to hone in on, okay, a certain set of neighborhood issues seem to be bubbling to the surface here, and it seems like there are opportunities that might relate to information. Um, so finally, to supplement some of our, uh, some of what we were seeing in terms of this existing work, uh, we worked with our, our city point of contact uh, in the Open Data Office, CARA, to do a, a survey, monkey survey, asking folks just what, what information do you think would be most valuable to you if the city were to prioritize it for publication or were to help facilitate its use? Um, so ultimately, based on these sorts of inputs, our output on the find stage was a, a focus on equitable and complete neighborhoods in Madison. And so this, this became our, our starting off point for further investigation. So the next step is to refine use cases. And I'll be, I'll be curious to talk about this idea of a focus area and use cases versus a, a specific problem framing. Um, but in our model, we really want to want to hone in on, okay, within the context of neighborhood equity, um, you know, the provision of services at the neighborhood level, what are the, what are the real use cases, the opportunities for some, a community group or a community member to use open data? And the way we need to discover that is by talking to members of the community. Um, it's not rocket science, but it, it, it does take this real um, leather to pavement work of actually going out and talk, having real conversations with people. So the tactic we took in, in Madison um, was using kind of a, the approach of ethnographic interviews with stakeholders. So we, would, we identified, um, we worked with the city to do a stakeholder mapping exercise. We looked at existing lists of neighborhood actors, including neighborhood nonprofits, neighborhood associations, um, neighborhood ad advocates, other larger nonprofits that, that uh, kind of play a role in, in neighborhood issues in Madison. And uh, we also just looked at, you know, who, who had been present at the, for some of those inputs that we looked at earlier. So who was, who was providing feedback on the Imagine Madison process? Uh, and key here was going out and meeting people where they were. So you can see in this picture, we, we went out into the neighborhood coffee shop to meet someone nearby their house in their own neighborhood to really learn about their experience. Um, you know, what are, what are the things you're trying to do to make your neighborhood better and how might data play a role in that? Um, so at the end of this process, we're really capturing a lot of qualitative data, both about who, the who, who might need um, city data, who might want city data, who might benefit from city data, um, what, what data is relevant to, to this issue of neighborhood, neighborhood development and neighborhood equity. Um, 
And why? You know, why specifically? What are the specific things that, that these specific actors can do with neighborhood data? Um, and so you can see in the picture on the right, every, at the end of every day we would kind of compile our notes from our interviews, put them in sticky notes, and then start trying to identify trends and patterns um, that could help us understand the answers to these questions. Um, this is just a snapshot of we, we interviewed uh, 36 people in person, a, a few more if you count phone interviews. Um, and we were going out to meet people where they were, and this included intercepts as well. So um, we might go to a meeting uh, for the Imagine Madison process and find someone there who's also at the meeting and just start talking to them about their, their ideas of how to make their neighborhood better and, and kind of stop trying to suss out what information might be relevant to that. Um, so what was the output of this process? Um, really the result is that we're able to better get a sense of who, who might benefit from Madison's open data in the context of making, it, making neighborhoods better and more equitable. Um, and, and, and who should be the target, who should be in the city's um, mind when they're thinking about how they share data um, to help improve neighborhoods? So we developed these six personas. They include a community activist, a large nonprofit project manager, a small community-based organization director, um, a connector, this is really a, a persona that's, that's thinking through um, researchers and uh, really what we call data intermediaries, folks that are taking city data and making it more accessible to others. The disseminator, uh, so this might be a journalist, as well as the city staffer. Um, so this is really reflective of, of the different uh, types of folks that we were speaking to. And importantly, these personas are based on our real conversations with real people. So step three is to actually just to take that, the first two steps that are really about understanding information needs and opportunities for use of, of open data. Um, and the third and fourth steps of our tactical data engagement model, it's about actually moving beyond discovery and exploration and into action. Um, so in step three, it's about designing a plan by coordinating with target users. Um, so at this stage in our process, one of, the, one of the key opportunities that was uncovered during our user research, during those ethnographic interviews, um, was that small community-based organizations, they, they had uh, clear opportunities and needs for data, both in their grant application process and in their grant reporting process, um, but they were very unfamiliar with the city's data assets. Most of them did not really know anything about the city's open data portal, um, or they didn't really feel the city had everything they needed. If they did, if they were using data or they were looking somewhere for data, they were actually looking to some of the connectors in the community, um, including the Neighborhood Indicators Project uh, in, uh, partner in Madison, Wisconsin, um, the Applied Population Lab, which is providing kind of more neighborhood-focused data, but actually in partnership with the city. Um, so the tactic we use in this case is to start to plan a data toolkit for community -based, small community-based organizations to better connect to the data sources that are available to them. So we're in the process right now of reconvening some of the stakeholders and target users to plan this intervention of training and toolkits to help uh, these small nonprofits uh, actually use data for grant applications or for grant reporting. And uh, the, the very tentative plan right now is to actually do this in, in conjunction with an RFP that's going to be coming out from the city. So the city will put out an RFP. It's specifically targeted at, at um, violence reduction and safety in the north side neighborhood of Madison. And working directly with uh, nonprofits in the north side, like the North Side Planning Council, um, to think through how can how can we help nonprofits do a better, more thoughtful job at their grant applications and their grant reporting um, in the context of this specific violent reduction grant with a data toolkit? So we're not there yet, but the final step will, of course, be to implement that, um, that intervention and that, that's in the term of the cluster model, that data-driven solution, um, by collaborating directly with those small nonprofits in the north side. Um, so we're really excited to take that on in the coming months. Um, I think as, as I mentioned early on, 
this has been a process uh, and a, an iteratively developed framework for thinking about how city halls can take a, a people first approach to open data and in so doing better connect their data to use um, and, and, and by extension to impact. Um, and so we've been, throughout our pilot work in Madison, we've been really documenting lessons learned, um, including things uh, that sound like uh, we're similar to some of the lessons you learned in, in Toronto, jean uh, And we'll be continuing to update our tactical data engagement guide. Uh, version 2.0 will come out later this year, so look for that on our website. And if you have ideas on how to improve it, feel free to reach out to us. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And with that, we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of this uh, event. So if you are listening and have questions, you can type them into the chat box on your webinar screen. You can also tweet them to us at Sunlight Cities or at the hashtag tactical data. I'll uh, answer the first question, which is always one of our most common, which is, will these slides be available? The answer is yes. We will post a recording of this webinar as well as a link to the deck uh, on Sunlight's website a little bit later this week. So Stephen, I'm going to uh, take your point that you just made about putting people first to ask our first question, which is about the people who do this work, uh, city staff. And I'll, I'll ask this to both of you. Um, what are some of the reasons why you know, city staff in cities everywhere are short on time and resources and they have a lot of other priorities and important work that they need to do? What are some of the reasons why you see city staff take on this work? How does it, how does it fit into other city priorities that might be competing? And Stephen, I'll, I'll ask that to you first. Yeah, great. I think this question of why is really central to our thinking on tactical data engagement in the first place. One of the things we were seeing in our, in our um, you know, multiple years of work directly with city halls on their open data programs is that very frequently um, when you ask, okay, why, why does it matter that you put this data on the website, they might be able to, to kind of connect it to some conceptual ideas of transparency and we care about that. We care about the right, public right to information, but when we really really delved into that question of why. Why does it matter that this is up there now? Um, there wasn't a lot of clarity around what is this actually doing? What is the value of this? Um, and that becomes potentially a, a barrier when you need budget and you need resources to continue to make progress on this, the, that kind of right to information um, side of it. Uh, if you need staffing, if you need um, a, a technical infrastructure to do these things. And so part of our motivation was to really help cities think through this question of why in a specific and detailed way. Why does someone need that data? How can we, and, and how can we capture the story if, if, it's, if someone's using that data of the good things they're doing with it? Um, but also, who's not using it but should be? Um, and how can, how can we support their access to that data? And why would we want to do that? Or, or, like why is really a central part of the investigation um, and the motivator that we see here for city staff. And I think, you know, your point about capacity um, for city staff is, is well taken. In Madison, we, you know, we worked with, uh, with a, a design uh, research consultant, Reboot, and we did a two-week in-depth design sprint um, where we spent over an hour with, with you know, about 40 people. Um, so that was a, that was a pretty intensive um, two-week sprint that not a whole lot of city staff are going to be able to take on on their own. Um, but we've worked in other cities where you can get, you can squeeze a lot of the lemon juice out of that. You know, I think the thing is you get 80% of the juice out of the first squeeze of the lemon. And I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of things you can do to get a lot of that same value. Um, so whether it is, uh, you know, in Glendale, Arizona, we worked with City Hall on, on, a, on a tactic that was really just picking up the phone and calling people who had requested data. Uh, or had requested information. And so calling up, you, know, you can have those conversations remotely as well. Um, and I think you, there are ways that any city can really start putting people first and start thinking about actual users, um, even from their desks. You know, they know a lot of the stakeholders and the beneficiaries of their services um, and of uh, the people, that, the allies that are aligned with their, their city mission. Um, and the people who might need their information, the people that call them up asking them questions or come to their counter asking them questions. Thinking about those real people and, and what they might need can go a long way to, to improving the way that open data gets done. 
Shanui, do you have anything that you want to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, just to, to kind of resonate um, or emphasize a few things that I think themes that are coming out of both of our models here. In in one way, I think you know what we're what we're seeing in Canada, and I'm sure it's probably the same in the U.S. is that you have um, you know political expectations that have been set because of you know, commitments that have been made by adopting open data policies and open data programs and really kind of providing a new kind of look, uh, you know, uh, of, of the city itself by modernizing and adopting kind of open government approaches. And then on the other hand, you've got, um, you know, civic uh, actors that are quite mobilized and don't necessarily need, you know, the city to help them convene. But squeezed in the middle, you've got, you know, teams within within cities that you know face pressure from uh, from both ends, and I think there's a that creates an imperative to actually, you know, especially for a team like you know an open data team within a city that can define how it can be resourceful and what value it brings to other agencies and divisions and sections within a, a public administration, in terms of kind of connecting that engagement piece with the data problems that they might be facing. And I've seen this, you know, done in, in, in multiple cities and, you know, a great example of this has been, you know, the open data lead at the City of Toronto who, you know, consistently steps outside of, um, you, know, uh, you know, his office hours to go and kind of go and create that kind of ambassadorial kind of like function and role. And I think the approach that we're describing is very much kind of context. Uh, driven, um, and in my mind, you know, the, the other imperative there is is about scaling, scaling, you know, uh, scaling up, scaling wide, but then also kind of scaling deep in terms of being able to connect with different communities of practice and, and residents, and kind of really understanding where they're coming from. Um, I think that gives a the, the fuller kind of understanding and, and picture of you know the types of issues and problems that um, that a city can can help uh, resolve. Yeah, great. Um, well, to your point about um, being an ambassador, I think we've had a couple questions about how do you become an ambassador for this even within the city. Um, how do you, and I, I think Jean-Louis, I'll, I'll ask you this first, how do you convince, what, what advice do you have to city staff who are having a hard time convincing their own colleagues about the value of open data or community engagement? Right, so I think I think the the key here is you know, and this brings me back to you know when I first started doing open data, and the the conversation that I really wanted to have was around how to fight corruption in in Montreal, but that obviously wasn't the first issue that we raised when we talked to you know political leaders and and uh, you know uh, the the team at the time that you know under which they had the responsibility to deal with uh, with open data, and so I think you have to be strategic in you know the types of problems, the types of issues to be able to build that case, do that proof of concept do the use cases like, uh, like Stephen and, and some might do as part of their methodology, and then iteratively kind of learn from that experience. Um, so to try to kind of you know, demonstrate that it is possible to kind of have a data-driven conversation um, with constituencies that you know, are already mobilized. And you know, I've seen this many times how you know, cities are, you know, city uh, public officials are quite surprised to see how people are already data literate and they have so much to contribute to you know, issues that may seem to be residing in the silos or confines of a, um, of a city uh, office. So you know, I think there's kind of this mutual kind of benefits and mutual interest that kind of also bridges into shared values around transparency and accountability and civic engagement that really lends itself to a very, very fruitful collaboration. And I think that that can be a little bit surprising at first, but once you start kind of working in that way, um, it becomes kind of a, a default position that you need to validate and engage as you're working through, you know, different hoops internally to release more data. You want to understand, you know, who's the end user at the, at the, the, the end of your life cycle of your the data management that you're, you're responsible for. Uh, how do you find your shared values is such a great, great question and a great place to start. Um, Stephen, I'm going to not let you answer that one because we have too many questions in the queue. Um, we have another one which is how do you measure performance on engagement? I think there's a trade-off between 
really um, connecting one-on-one -on -one with ind individual residents and their needs, but you also need to do that for a lot of people in yeah. the city. How do you measure the way that you're doing this work? Excuse me. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Our approach so far has been, we think it's been such a black box around how, like how, how has engagement mattered or how has, how has open data mattered that we are starting as we're prototyping this model um, with, with anecdotal evidence of, of how engagement has resulted in, uh, in progress on, an, on a neighborhood issue or on a city issue. Um, so whether that's, whether it's figuring out that, hey, we actually need statistics on, you know, neighborhood crime at a very granular level in order to do, to use that in our grant reports, um, or whether it's a city learning that, okay, a, a research university has used their open data to apply for a grant and they got a, they successfully got a federal grant that included, you know, their, the city's um, open data in the application. Um, or whether it's just learning that, you know, someone, someone found information about um, the services available in their cities on the website. Just capturing those, those user stories, the stories of how does information matter, is what we have seen as a, as a crucial first step. And so in measuring how well engagement is being done or really what's, the, what's been the impact of it, um, we're encouraging cities to really start with those anecdotes. And there are some models out there for taking a more quantitative approach. I'm not in love with almost any of them that I've seen. Um, but it is a trade-off because you do want to be able to track things like um, page views or, or downloads um, or API calls and all of those kinds of things. Um, but really it's an intermediate metric because what you want to know is, okay, what, what was the result of that data set download? What was the result of that, that page view? Um, but, you know, there are other sort of intermediate things that can be really valuable. Are you, are you communicating about your data? Are you doing events? How many events are you doing? How many people are coming to your events? Um, so you know, these are all valuable to keep track of if you can, um, but like we've said, our, one, of the, one of the key aspects of our models, we're trying to make it tactical, make it so that anybody can do it. And so even if you don't have a robust infrastructure for quantitatively measuring engagement, start with those anecdotes. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, well, on that theme, uh, Jameson, one of our listeners, has a question, which is that uh, data staff are often very technical and have a lot of technical understanding of how to publish data and all of the requirements there, but residents often are not. And how do you help, how, how can they bridge that divide? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and I'd say on the flip side of that question is, uh, is that often IT staff are, are not necessarily going to have um, the best and most complete knowledge of an issue, so like say housing or um, or, or parks and recreation or um, you know or, or historic preservation or whatever it happens to be crime um, and others in the community who might not have technical literacy will have a lot of really valuable expertise that when combined with that data can go a long way um, and so it is a tough challenge to um, for both of those parties to meet the other where they are. Um, but we see it as valuable and increasingly imperative for, for you know, the future of government, for open government. Um, so I, I guess what I would, like the practical advice that I would give um, to Jameson is to think about, okay, what, how can you uncover what those pain points are? Like what are those barriers that, you're, that the non-technical stakeholders are facing? And just what are some ways that they could be technical or they could be non-technical? It's sometimes as simple as what are other ways that the information can be shared? Um, is it having someone there who is a, a data set owner um, or can be a, a technical translator, an intermediary, um, someone that can help explain the data to that person who might have subject matter expertise or might be a beneficiary, might have a real stake in what the data is, you know, the insights the data contains. Um, so, yeah, you know, it could be as simple as one of the things we found in Madison with a lot of the nonprofits, when they were trying to get relevant information from City Hall, they had someone they called. And for some of them, they knew someone to call and some of them they didn't. Um, and so just making it clear, like, who can I talk to who can help me decipher this data if, it, if you've got a non-technical stakeholder? 
Yeah, just to, just to jump in maybe on that question. I mean, I think you know, to your point, Stephen. I think it's you know being able to identify intermediaries and also being able to understand like the the skill set of different types of organizations who can work with data. I mean, I think that's that's an emerging kind of area, just even within the social sector, for example, where. You know the the work you know as frontline uh, service providers um, you know directly in providing uh, services and they understand you know the the needs of you know residents at the local level but they don't necessarily have the the resources or the time to be able to kind of self assess themselves in terms of their own kind of technical capacity and I think that's that's a critical piece I think you know often we look at Kind of the, the you know certain expertise uh, at the local level or even just in broader kind of city contexts you know from a kind of private sector uh, you know standpoint but I think you know understanding the capacity of the social sector to utilize data is a big part of the equation um, and you know I think it's, it goes back to um, uh, being able to kind of provide that con that critical kind of context piece um, and to ask those questions in a way that's actually conducive to creating dialogue opportunities. And by that I mean, and this kind of falls into a, a project that we're currently doing um, on issues of data poverty. So just like you have um, you know, food deserts in cities, you also have data deserts. And you know, one way of you know, communicating that very effectively is through data visualizations. And what do you see or what do you not see can be quite revealing and kind of using Kind of basic ways of being able to tell that story and build a narrative to say like, okay, like, you know, what choices did we make, you know, and why are we only seeing the world in that way? And why, what would we need to do in order to have a fuller understanding of our neighborhoods and communities and whatnot? Which goes to, I think, points that we've both been making around kind of different data sources and creating linkages and alliances with a range of different types of stakeholders. But I think that that notion of data poverty for us has been one that we're, we're keen to, to explore and that we're going to do over the next few months here. Yeah, those are huge issues. We could probably do separate webinars all about those two things that you just mentioned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, we just have about five minutes left, so and I want to get through. We have a few more questions, so I'm going to uh, inelegantly segue to um, what data sets should we publish? Um, one of our listeners writes in, it sounds like they're probably at the beginning stages. Um, how can you, what data sets sh should cities prioritize? Is there sort of a standard uh, beginner's kit to data sets for cities that are fairly new to this? Maybe I can jump in. I mean, there's a range of different, different methodologies that exist out there. One, what we've tried to do and what we've done, funded by the Canadian government, is to create a do it yourself toolkit for municipalities who, you know, see how other cities are moving forward with their open data programs, but you know, are trying to kind of set out their own kind of planning process. So that's our, our DIY, which is a kind of a response to, to that. Um, you know, I think that the key is to be able to, because we know that cities, you know, are connected and look to each other um, in terms of the decisions that they make in terms of like data release, and that makes a lot of sense when you start looking at you know, how data is being used in one context to another um, and the types of solutions that are created there. And I think the, kind of the issue of interoperability really goes back to kind of, you know, if you're going to put out data, then also think about you know, what format and what standard you want to be able to, to put it out. And we've got a project right now working with the Municipal Information Systems Association in Canada where we're you know, doing just that, working with you know, um, their members in Ontario and you know, surveying you know, perceived benefits, perceived impact of data sets, and then coming up with a short list of 10 based on you know, 20 or so data sets that we've identified. Um, and then looking at, okay, what are the best practices in terms of, of standardization of, of data so that you're, you know, you're not just working in silos, but you're actually maximizing the impact across the board at the local level so that you have, you know, and you make some, some steps towards developing a, a national urban data strategy, which is you know, something that we're keen to be able to contribute to through this work. And uh, that does sound like a perfect opportunity for me to plug uh, another of Sunlight's projects, uh, which is the U.S. City Open Data Census. For, yes. So for those of you on the, on the call from, uh, as, as Jean-Louis said, south of the border, um, 
this, uh, this is a tool that Sunlight um, puts out on, on the Open Knowledge uh, International platform. Um, and it, it contains a basket of 19 data sets that, that uh, we've seen as um, fairly fundamental across um, all city halls. And so certainly we'd encourage cities to start there. It, it's, it's fun and gamified. You can compare yourself to other U.S. cities. And in fact, this Saturday on Open Data Day, um, we're going to be doing a submit-a-thon to the census. So if you want to help track how, uh, how your city is doing uh, on this basket of 19 data sets, uh, whether they're sharing them and making them available online, and how open it actually is, is it machine readable, is it open licensed, et cetera, uh, then please do participate with us. We'll be here in Washington, D.C. at an in-person event, um, and also in New York City. Um, but we're encouraging folks to participate from all over the country and to log in. So check that out on our website. Yeah, and it's something that uh, we'll also be hosting online. You can join by Google Hangout, and it's uh, also something that we can that you can do anytime. Uh, we're doing it in a focused way this Saturday, that anyone anywhere can always fill out their city's uh, open data set on the on the uh, open data census. Uh, to that to that point, uh, we got another question about data infrastructure from Bob. How does data infrastructure impact community use? Basically, if you have a terrible website and uh, you only publish Excel documents, can your community still use open data for impact? Yeah, I mean I, that's a great question. I think what we've seen around in, in Canada is kind of a, uh, a way for cities to collaborate amongst themselves to join um, their data sets on a uh, on the shared open data portal. So you have that kind of regional approach to uh, data curation that kind of creates incentives to data standardization, creates incentives for kind of multi-stakeholder data governance uh, as well. And so that regionalism that we've seen in the region of Peel, Niagara, and province of Quebec, working with a number of different municipalities here, I think it's you know, like it, there's there's some putting yourselves in the in the shoes of data users has to be kind of the primary kind of measurement here. How do we make data more easily accessible and usable in a timely, comprehensive, interoperability interoperable way for users themselves? I think that needs to be kind of the benchmark that we set for for ourselves. Yeah, I, we've also thought a lot about this question. It's also um, it's also come up in some of our pilot work and in cities that will go unnamed. Um, but you know, I, I think when you've got a, a data set that is maybe not of high quality uh, or, or a data infrastructure that is, is really not robust enough um, for your ambitions, we do believe there are things you can do to get started. And whether that's, um, you know, whether that's responsibly sharing a data set that might have a lot of challenges or quality issues with it, but being clear about what those issues are, um, doing it in a contained setting where there's maybe a focus group of potential users to ask them, hey, what are you seeing as the issues with this and what can we focus on for improving this? Um, that's certainly something you can do to get started. I mean, the other thing is being open about your problems. I mean, this is something that we all know from our own, our own lives is often the first step for addressing our problems. Um, so, you know, one of the impacts that can come from, from uh, the application of open data in the context of a city that doesn't have a strong data infrastructure is, is empowering the public constituents to see, oh my God, this is our data infrastructure. Um, maybe we should do something about that. And, you know, that can be a powerful, um, you know, kind of talking point, moment of realization um, for, for city leaders and for those who control the purse strings. So, um, you know, that, that, I think there are always things that can be done. The last thing I'll say is there's always information, and people need information to make decisions and to navigate the city, um, whether, it's, whether it's machine readable, open data or not. So there are often ways that you can provide more, um, better access to information in ways that could be low tech, um, it could be verbal, it could be in person, it could be, um, you know, sometimes even sharing a PDF is progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even a PDF. Um, well, with that, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We're at the top of the hour. I want to thank Stephen and jean louis for uh, sharing all of your insights. Thank you so much for taking the time and to everyone who joined us. Like I said, we will be posting the slides as well as a recording to this webinar on, our, on Sunlight's website later this week. So thanks once again.
for uh, joining us today and look for more information from us soon.